brown chick changing the face of therapy on both, both. sides of the couch i like to trip you up now that's what i'm that's I, alisa that's likes to change up her rhythm <laughs> she likes to change up the song and then expects me to follow along we're doing great brown sugar erica <laughs> i like that you call it a song you do you like to sing it <laughs> you like to sing it <laughs> i had to put my Wait, hold on, I couldn't hear you. I said, I, sorry, I had, like, somebody, like, I had to put on Do Not Disturb. It's not a song. I was about to say, I need to. It is. I'm about to do the same thing, because I've had three phone calls in the last 15 minutes, and I don't know why. Why? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All we right. are doing, we are doing great today. Okay. Um, better than, I was not feeling well yesterday, so <laughs> I was able to get myself together. My voice is back yesterday. That'd have been a fun day, laugh. <laughs> I know. My family was like, yes, she can't talk. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get into well, we it. Appreciate. What are we talking about today? Ebony, go ahead and lead the show. <laughs> yes, thank you all for joining us for week two of our BIPOC Mental Health Month series. And today we're going to talk about how racism impacts your mental health. Obviously, you know that we love to talk about race and mental health, and especially the mental health of Black and Latinx communities. And what we do know is that, you know, race plays a part. Race, race, racism, discrimination, all of those things play a part in our mental health. And so we just wanted to have a conversation around that um, today on a live, and we would love for y'all to send us questions. Um, please, we want questions around this topic, of course, because um, that's what we're talking about today. And I was thinking maybe for the last, and I'm, we're discussing this on live, maybe for the last week, we could just do like a Q&A, <laughs> since people seem to have like questions like that kind of span <laughs> away from some of the topics, but that's what we're doing. And I believe there is a little question mark in a a talk yeah. bubble that you click if you put a question there then we will use that to answer questions toward the end of the live so that yeah. is what we are chatting about today yes yes that'll be the and, and so your questions don't get lost there also because then we got to scroll back through all of the questions so yeah i'm loving that we are doing this it is bipoc mental health month um so let's get into it right so mm -hmm. I think this is important for us to discuss, and I saw some of the comments earlier around me posting about this topic that we'd be discussing, and I think somebody had said, I'm so glad you're talking about this because I really felt like it was some sort of genetic flaw, right? Like that we have, you know, maybe suffer from challenges to our mental health, and certainly you know, what, what happens in our families and it can be generational in terms of vulnerabilities around certain mental health issues, right? Certainly that, our DNA plays a role in that. However, right, however, we don't always question the impact on our mental health that the systems in which we exist have on our health, the stressors that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And, you know, I think we hear this term a lot these days, but do we really know what it means when we speak of intergenerational trauma, right? Like the trauma that gets passed down in our DNA, much of which is related to, is in direct correlation to the racism that we have endured for generations. So it's so important that when we are thinking about our mental health, that we're taking this into consideration. Um, and also the racism that exists within the mental health field, right, which is why we don't always, you know, historically hasn't been necessarily welcoming. It, it was, let's just be straight. It wasn't made for us, right? The mental health field as it exists today was created by white men Exactly. Them, right? Exactly. So, so yeah, go ahead, Ebony. Yeah. No, what you said is exactly right. Like this, we are learning to, we've had to learn to live in systems that were not created for us. And that includes the mental health and therapy field. And so a big part of what we do is while we do practice um, traditional therapy, you know, in a sense, we... Uh, continue to learn and continue to try to make sure we're practicing it in a way that resonates with our clients and with our communities. 
And I think that it's extremely important. And this is why people struggle. I just saw like a, um, a, a I don't know, real around like, you know, talking to your white therapist. I think my friend that sent it to me is in the chat right now. But um, but it was just, you know, you're talking about these experiences that can be universal as far as like being a person of color, being a black person, a Latinx person, these universal experiences. And sometimes when you do have a white therapist, they, um, you know, can turn it into something that it wasn't or uh, what's the word I'm looking for? create opportunity it can create a system and i mean create an opportunity for you not to feel safe right where they right. feel like they have to report report something certain things or they have decided that this behavior needs to be pathology why can't i Patho say that pathology. <laughs> <laughs> where we are diagnosing behavior that seems like this is just something that is common within our community so that's why this is important and of course when we talk about this topic the first thing that always comes to my mind is the term that I learned about for the first time from our podcast between session between sessions which is racial battle fatigue and it was something that i had never heard of before and we had an amazing therapist on that was talking about it and shared shout this out, term that was shout out huh? to adult therapy shout out to her yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, well i feel like that's something that and that's why one of the reasons why i love our podcast is because we are while we're doing our work and we're working as therapists and doing research, we're talking to other therapists that are in our field that are taking completely different approaches and have other information that we may not come across um, because there's so much information out there. So, uh, but racial battle fatigue was a term that was coined in 2008 by critical race theorist William Smith. And this was uh, the way he discussed it was in um, when looking at black men that were on predominantly white college universities and the way that they would um, stress will manifest and how they would actually feel uh, physical symptoms because of discrimination, racism, things like that. So the definition is cumulative result of a natural race related stress response to distressing mental health and emotional conditions. These conditions emerge from constantly facing racial dis racially dismissive, demeaning, insensitive and or hostile racial environments and individuals and also with that recognizing that in the event of discrimination or perceived discrimination because it does not matter it still impacts us the same way whether it's true discrimination or if it feels like there was discrimination um as well as the anticipation of those things happening created this stress response that included like feeling sick to your stomach and headaches and dizziness and, and all of this stuff these physical symptoms from racism so that was a, a hundred percent the first thing of course i thought about when we talked about this topic yeah yeah and we just had dr lawanda hill on recently i think it was last week right talking about how yeah. the workplace environment right think about like the workplace environment how much time you spend in the workplace environment and mm -hmm. so many of us have worked in 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 environments where you are um, you know, you undergo microaggressions, you undergo, um, you know, uh, discrimination, all of the things, right? And you have to show mm -hmm. up on a regular basis, like your livelihood depends on it, right? So some of the things I want, I want us to think about and talk about in terms of stressors is what are some of the stressors that, you know, the race, the racism that we endure. So Think mm -hmm. about, you know, you mentioned, you know, Black Latinx, and, and this goes beyond, you know, Latinx is this big umbrella, right? But we're talking also like the, the, the more people can see, right, your skin color, because we got colorism in there as well, right? The more mm -hmm. likely you are to endure um, some of these, this, the battle, the racial battle fatigue, the microaggressions, the macroaggressions. And so one of the stressors is just the ongoing vicarious trauma that we see. Um, you can't turn, you can't not, be, you cannot be online and mm -hmm. go a week without hearing about another black man, black boy, black woman, uh, black girl has been shot, has been wrongly detained. Um, you can't go, it, 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 you know, you have people um, here recently in Texas, we had, um, I think there was like 50 people that they found um, that had passed away in, a, truck right like that they were trying to come oh, yeah. to mm -hmm. you know so it's like you you ha this is on our mind that it, you know especially that you can leave the house right and depending on what you look like 
you may not come back or your children may not come back or your loved mm -hmm. ones may not come back. That's a stressor that is unique to the communities. Mm -hmm. Right? Like that you even mm -hmm. have to think about that is, an, is, is right. a stressor. How is that not going to impact our mental health? Right? Like I think people think about when we think about mental health, we, we like we've talked about this before, we go to the very like a mental illnesses that, you know, you hear about where people are, are, are really struggling to function to get through a day but this this is high functioning folk like you have a career you have a job you have a family you have a social life but this is one of the stressors that you have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis that you go somewhere to get a table and you you know you're gonna mm -hmm. be treated a certain way so we have to take some of these things into consider consideration that these are unique to the populations yeah. And I think what you're speaking to is exactly why I think therapy and or whatever your mental health journey is, is extremely important because living in black and brown bodies already creates stress without you doing anything else, without any other things happening in your life, you are already more stressed because of having to live in your body and what that means in life. And I think sometimes we normalize so many things that we go through. We normalize so many of our stressors and things like that, that we just, it, it just becomes like, oh, it is what it is. And then you're adding on other areas that create stress that maybe you do have a little bit more control over, right? Maybe you can shift a little bit more. And that's why I think it is extremely important for us to start those journeys um, as black and brown people, because we already come into this world with the stress of the things that you just named, as well as how people treat you because of your skin color, as well as being told you have to be twice as good or 10 times as good or a hundred times as good, right? Or, you know, going into a store and being followed around, whatever, like you already are having those, you're already having those experiences at a very young age, typically yeah. way younger than you would even remember. Um, and so you have already kind of have this level of stress where you're already at like a four or five every day, just walking through the world. And then we're adding on the other stuff. And so that's why I think while we can't obviously control our skin color, we can't control how people treat us um, fully, you know, we can try to work and get the systems to, to treat us fairly and all of that. What can we control, right? Can I control my relationships? Can I control my friendships? Can I control how I interact with my family if they're causing me stress and trauma? Like, are there other ways that I can control and work to have better or less stress in those other areas because we know that walking around in our in our black and brown bodies is going to already create some stress yeah right and just the sense the lack of safety we feel in certain spaces it was interesting i was just talking to my brother yesterday he came to visit and i don't know how or why we started talking about this and he's like yeah you don't remember that time so um we we grew up like i grew up in a, in a town where there was very few there was no black people and there was a handful of Mexicans, right? And mm -hmm. um, we were outside, just kids. Like we were kids, right? Playing outside on the bikes. And this drunk white woman comes and starts cursing us out, calling us, you know, you dirty ass Mexicans and blah, 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 blah. And um, he was recalling like that, you know, the way my father reacted was like, let's just get inside. Like, because you also recognize that you can't go, you know, you, your safety often depends on how you also respond. How you so respond. What, mm -hmm. Right. But, but the stress of, of living in some of these environments, right, where people can just spew venom to you and your response to that to protect yourself can be then what is punished. Right. Like right. you see it all right. the time. Right. Like you see it all the time. And I think that another, you know, way that racism impacts us is, again, that it is within our systems. Um, even I mean, it's no secret if you are not aware of the health discrep the discrepancies within the, the, the medical field of how black and brown mm -hmm. folks are treated. Right. Like people still still are taught in medical school. Like they're still taught to this day yep. that black people can endure more like, pain mm -hmm. because of the yep. color of their skin. Yep. That's insane that in 2022, doctors, right, who people, doctors are often placed on this pedestal that is, you know, God doctor, right? Like that they are being taught that black folks don't experience as much pain because of their skin color.
Right. Like, what is that? What is that? And I just reposted something last week. There was a nurse, and I'm, you all may have seen it. I, I think she, uh, I don't know if she works as a psychiatrist. Anyways, that's not important. But she was going, she was talking about the importance of uh, with, like uh, representation in these different fields, right? And so she uh, was taking over her shift and there was another woman, I believe it was a white woman, who was telling her, oh, let me just warn you about this patient right it was in the oh it was a um, woman having a baby she like i just put in a psych um request for her because she keeps hitting her head and so the nurse was like what do you mean she she keeps hitting her head and she said yeah she keeps hitting her head every time i go in there she's like wait is she black and she's like yes exactly she's like okay so she had to explain to her right like she this is how we scratch our scalp um, when we can't access it because if we're in a wig or a weave or whatever. But again, like it is in the systems in which we go to seek out help. How is this stress, how is access to care not going to impact us, you know, our mental health and our physical health? Right, 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 right. And it's, goes, it's funny because I kind of went back through the comments and I saw Creating Forever had said when I was talking about um, white therapists and how sometimes they just don't understand, it goes right to what you're saying. They have different norms, right? And they often will either other us or they'll pathologize was the word. But yeah, they will pathologize our experiences or our norms instead of truly trying to understand or even ask a question. Like instead of just assuming that this is what it is, asking a question so that you can then understand, come from a place of curiosity as opposed to that authority of I know everything and this doesn't make sense in my worldview. So that means this can't be real and that can't be like it must be something wrong. Right, you know, and um, so we want to encourage you, if you do have questions, please submit this, please submit them again, if you just recently joined, I'm Elisa Bokeen. And I'm Ebony Harris. We're Melanin and Mental Health, and we are here doing this throughout the month of July in honor of BIPOC Mental Health Month, um, and we are talking today about how racism impacts our mental health. And another, another way that this can impact us, again, is us feeling, like, feeling resistant to going or uh, right. to access care, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think about people who are immigrants, right? So we specialize in highlighting issues around the Black and Brown Latinx community. And for people who are immigrants and who may actually need help, they could be, um, especially if they're undocumented, fear going out to get the support that they need. Or right, so right. many of them, their, their travel to get here includes, I mean, it is traumatic to have to leave your, you know, your country and not even just undocumented folks, even folks that are here moving to another country and the trauma that comes with that, the, the mental health challenges that come with that, and then not feeling like you can go out and get support. That's going to impact our mental health. So we want to think about acute stress and chronic stress, right? Like, and mm -hmm. we've talked about this before, acute stress, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Shout out to our colleague and dear friend, Rashawn of Stress, right? Who talks about stress is a good thing, right? So we have a project coming up, this kind of stress, but that motivates me so I can get that project right. done. That's a good kind of stress. And we know that it, there's an ending to it. It's gonna, it's gonna be done by the end of this week and I'll, I can relax. Chronic mm -hmm. stress, is when there is no end, right? Like, so whether it's a chronic disease, whether it is you are living in a stressful, traumatic, um, inducing environment, and racism, like we don't have a date when this is supposed to end. It's something that we've just had to learn to live with. And I think right, what we right. talked about is because not only do we know it's something we have to live with our parents, our grandparents, our great grandparents, right? Like they all knew the same. We, we have to try and still in spite of this, find joy, find um, well-being, find self-care. 
Well, all of that also can make us susceptible to enduring more, right? Like, so sometimes our threshold for stress, for pain is so high, mm -hmm. we are not tending to our stress as it comes along because we don't see it as stress. Like, this is just, this just is how life is. This is it's how we do norm. life. It's just the norm. Mm -hmm. And so what we want to continue to stress is that, no, this should not be the norm. Yes, we should still tend to our mental health. Yes, it's still difficult. And it is vitally important that we are tending to ourselves. Right, right. That's, you know, it's funny because I, I feel like, Every time I scroll, I'm like, oh, okay, this is a good comment. And then you talk, and I'm like, exactly like this goes. So that damn Deanna said, weathering is a term I learned about a few years ago as well when we were talking about racial battle fatigue. And I feel like what you're talking about, um, which I looked up just weathering, right, which is just the process of wear wearing or being worn by long exposure to a certain atmosphere. And so black and brown people get this ongoing stress, this, you know, regular weathering, wear and tear, all of that. And it does become the norm. Right? right this becomes like this is just the new normal this is just what life is but the reality is the more and more you're worn down the no, the more difficult it becomes to deal with other stress right the more difficult it becomes for you to even handle um life as it comes at you if that makes sense so i think it is extremely important that we recognize that just because you get used to something doesn't mean it's not having an, a, a long-term impact on you or impacting your health in a negative way right. is we shouldn't believe that well i'm just used to it so it's fine that our body is not still remembering the stress and our body is still not trying to figure out how to fight it and this is why we're getting sick more right this is why it's taking us longer to motivate ourselves to do things that we want to do for ourselves and all, like understanding that just because it doesn't it's not at the front of mind does not mean it's not happening Right. It doesn't mean, and, I, and I'm glad that you made that point of the impact that chronic stress, right, and racism being one of our major stressors, because mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's embedded in the systems and in the environment in which we live, right, in which we live, is that um, it does have an impact then on our health, right? Yep. So, you know, so many people talk about Oh, the reason that uh, Black folks and you know Latinx folks, Latinos, what what have you, you know, they have these high levels of, um, you know, uh, they have poor food choices, right? Like we talked mm -hmm. about this with Dr. Ebony on our uh, podcast not not that long ago, and with your Latina nutritionist, mm -hmm. is that we blame so many things on the people, right? It's how they eat. It's that yep. they, it's, it's, it's how they manage stress. It's, um, you know, like the, they're, they're more prone the to choices violence. they're making. All, right. Mm -hmm. All of the BS never, and it always puts the onus back on the people, right. Who are trying to endure the system in which they live, who are trying to just get through it. Right. Um, who don't have access right, that don't have access to, to health care, and the access that they do have is often limited and is a racist, you know, medical field, right? They don't have maybe access to therapy. Um, they don't have access to fresh food. You, we don't talk about that. We talk about the results, what we're seeing, and how can we blame it on them. But this stress has an impact on our health. Right, it heart disease, um, diabetes, um, high blood pressure you name it, and so these are all things that we want you all to take into consideration. Because what can happen is when we're struggling, we're like, I'm just not trying hard enough, I'm just not trying hard enough. I have to push harder, I have to push harder, right? And because I, I, um, define my strength by how much pain I can tolerate, well, I must just be weak. Mm -hmm. No, mm -hmm. we're not, we're not, you know, the environment in which we're in is making us sick. Like if I'm in an asbestos filled building, I can't see the asbestos. I don't know that it's having an impact on right, my breathing, right. but I'm having chronic lung issues. Well, it must be because you're not working out hard enough. You got to improve your cardio. No, <laughs> I am in a toxic environment. So we want y'all to keep that in mind when you find yourself not being able to, I cannot just snap out of this. 
Right, right. And and recognizing when you are truly being, your experiences are being invalidated, right? When it, when it isn't, you have to be able to, and this is the hardest part, right? How do we speak up for ourselves? How do we say, no, it's not, I need to lose 50 pounds. No, it's not, I need to work out. No, it's not, I need to not eat food that is natural to my culture and all of that stuff. That's not the answer and that's not always the cause, right? Um, Brown Sugar Brown Sugar Erica said, when I was a teenager, I was forced to go to a white therapist. It was court ordered. When I tell you it was frustrating breaking down the lingo, the difference in the way we talk from the way they talk, um, and then that damn Deanna said, many high functioning people of color still have poor mental and physical health outcomes due to racial battle fatigue and weather. Right. Yes. So we have to acknowledge, like, again, I, I, it's funny because I listen to this podcast um, and they talk about like weight loss and, and fasting or whatever. And everybody on there talks about how they had done fasting to lose weight. And then, then COVID came. And while I was doing the same thing, the stress made me gain weight. The stress made me gain weight. And so you understand it when it comes to COVID or something in particular, but when we talk about living in black and brown bodies, and it, is, it doesn't resonate the same, right? right? We don't recognize how stress impacts our health, our mental health, right. all of that, you know, our physical health and our mental health. So it's extremely interesting, you know, that I'm glad, like you said, I'm glad we're having this conversation because I feel like we also have to kind of rewire the way we think about our bodies and our health, right? right, right. We also have to acknowledge that life it's just a little bit harder, right? And, and, it, and it's not fair and it does suck, but then how does that then impact other areas of your life? How does that impact your health? Or is it the fact, as Elisa said, are you just going to blame yourself and say, well, I'm not strong right, enough? Because right. that, that doesn't help. And it's funny because I was just, um, I did a video of, um, last week where I was talking about how we often feel like criticism or, or being critical of ourselves is motivating. Right. But are you, can you really, do you, if you hate something, if you don't like something, if you, you know, feel negatively about something, how likely are you to invest in it and want to change it and want to, you know, so really that critical part doesn't necessarily help us getting right. through. So yes, we can find all the reasons as to why, well, I need to do this and I need to do that. Sure. But you also have yeah. to be open and honest around like there's other factors that could be impacting you. And maybe you need to give yourself some compassion and some self-care and, and all of that to help you get to where you need to go as opposed to just the criticisms of like what you're not doing or, or, tell, or what society is telling you you should be doing. Yeah. So I know this can all feel like very gloom and doom and oh man, we're screwed. <laughs> but what I want to remind us of is that our people right like our lineage has endured this for so many years and we still manage to find joy somewhere right mm -hmm. like so the importance of us caring for ourselves our mental health and we talk about self-care all the time and I continue to to kind of share the definition that I like of self-care is the ongoing monitoring of our needs, our physical needs, mm -hmm. our emotional needs, our uh, psychological needs, et cetera. And then meeting those needs, tending to those needs. That's self-care. It's more than bubble baths, right? Mm -hmm. uh, although I love me a good bubble bath. But um, <laughs> and intentionally finding spaces that affirm us, that are safe, creating those spaces if we don't have one readily accessible, and finding joy because joy is the antidote to all of this pain. And whether that's mm -hmm. you creating joy within your day, it, you know, um, you know, I, I feel joy when I have a sip of my coffee and it's delicious, you right. know, or spending time with the people that I love. The impact, this is what we're dealing with. Know what you're dealing with, acknowledge it. Have that give you some self-compassion as like, this shit is hard right this is difficult <laughs> this is part of why i'm struggling it's not just i'm not you know i'm not hustling hard enough i'm managing this tend to myself as needed we heal in community right don't try and do this on your own we heal in connection to other humans whether that's therapy whether that's family whether that's friends uh, whether that's a support group and creating joy creating joy so i don't know if we don't have any questions we about to log off there is one question and if she's still in um i would love for you for you to kind of give a little bit more background let me see i think if you tap it yeah so that's the first part and then so do you think 
that if you intimidate your kids while they are young, that it will make them afraid of white supremacy. And what I mean by intimidate is yelling abuse. Um, and so I'm curious what you mean, uh, Brashik, Erica, if you're still on, as far as do you think uh, it will make them afraid of white supremacy? I, I, was, I wasn't I was sure exactly what you meant by that. Like, are you saying if we are, you know, yelling at them and all of that, then they will cower to white supremacy? Um, uh, well, she, before she answered, one thing that I um, I want to kind of also share on that is a lot of the times, like our communities, right, are we are, we have been known for corporal punishment, right? We've been and 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 there are many people out here trying to reverse that, right? Like to where how we parent. I want us to also remember that the way that we punish them is in direct connection to white supremacy, right? To how, um, you know, enslaved folks were treated. Yeah. And, yeah. and also the fear. Mm -hmm. Our children can't just get out of line. Our children right. can't just go somewhere and act up because it could literally be a life or death situation. And mm -hmm. sometimes the fear also like of, I have to get you in line. You have to understand, right? Like that, that, that often that is also rooted in our own trauma, in our intergenerational trauma. This is also in direct correlation to white supremacy so um mm -hmm. so i think that's something for us to keep in mind and the i don't know did she explain what she meant no she might not be on anymore so, so i, I was I, you know the other thing is these conversations are really rough um and so how do we talk to our children about it how do we make them aware and i think it it's they are difficult conversations, but I think about it like also um, in terms of sex, like sometimes it's difficult for, for parents to talk to their children about sex. So I think you do it di in digestible ways. Um, I think you do it in terms of, um, you know, like age appropriateness. Mm -hmm. Children are seeing these stories, right? Like children right, right. have access. So processing their feelings around them and maybe grieving with them, right? Like sharing in them. And then really also re, like reassuring them that, you know, mommy, daddy, you know, like whoever we are, we're going to keep you safe, right? Like we're going right. to keep you safe. Um, right. So, um, okay. So she says she explained okay. it. Okay. So I think that goes exactly what Elisa is saying. She said, what I mean is that we were told to never question the police, even if right. they were wrong. And I think that goes into exactly what Elisa is saying, as far as like, it came from a place of trying to be, make sure that the children are safe, that we are safe as a community. Right. And so, <clears throat> so I do think that there's something to be said around how do we empower, right? And how do we not teach from our past, from our trauma, while also keeping us safe, right? And I think that could be a hard balance because now we're saying, speak your mind. Don't, you know, make sure that they are treating you fairly, respectfully, make sure that they are treating you legally, you know, number one. Um, so all of that, but then the other side of it is like, as parents, I'm sure you're sending kids out and saying, speak your mind, but also that like, uh, but don't, you know, yeah, yeah. It's, it's scary. And I, and I also think about how, is, is it a way to teach them, I am here to protect you? And so when we are together, there may be a little bit more of a safety than when you're by yourself, right? Um, so I don't know, Lisa, I don't know I, you. Well, as a we've parent, had these conversations. I, yeah, as a parent, for me, your safety, you come home, that's the only thing I care about. At that moment, mm -hmm. it, it is literally a life or death situation. Assume right. that it's a life or death situation your safety just because of what you look like is in danger, right? Because um, the system in which that all happens, right? Like you are going to be automatically seen as a threat. So at that point, the only thing I care about is you coming home. So you just do what you got to do just so that you can come home. And, and that's a really difficult conversation also, I think, for us to have. That's that's my perspective. You know, somebody else might have a different perspective. And again, really, um, I think, explaining to children why those situations are a little different. Um, and um, And I think it, you know, it depends on the parent and how you parent your child and explaining the difference of, where is it that we, um, 
there are spaces that we that that advocating for yourself won't get you killed right right like um and i think that's a really fine line when we're talking about these other uh situations but i get it i get it like and that's another thing how racism impacts our our mental health we can't just raise children to be like you're free and you can you know like he's expressing himself or she's expressing like no that's my, no i couldn't just express myself right like right how can't just express himself you know he's right mine like it doesn't work like that so have conversations Right. And I think what you were saying, and she added more to it, but what about parents that yell at their kids um, on a constant basis that causes nervousness? So I feel like that goes into what you're saying as far as like, sometimes we just set the rules and we don't, you know, explain it. And I think about, this is a weird comparison, but you know, you, you start a job and then they have like this random rule and you're like, how did this rule become a thing? And it's like, oh, cause somebody did it. Like somebody, you know, stuck their hand somewhere they weren't supposed to. So now it has to be a rule. You can't stick your hand in there. Da, da, da. And I feel like sometimes it does start off with like, these are just the rules, but as they get older, can you start having more and more conversations around these are why the rules are in place. Yeah. Right. So yes, if you're constantly yelling and, and you know, get out the street, and didn't, you know, and, and that's the way that the, you're always responding to them, then yeah, they will, it will create some anxiety, right? It will create some nervousness. But as you get older, if you say, hey, I did that because I didn't have time to sit there and explain to you why you couldn't run in the street, you know, when it's a car coming, I don't have time to have that conversation, but I can always kind of communicate it to you later. So you can understand that every rule I have is 100% there for your protection is there for a reason. I'm not just making these things up for, out of nowhere. Well, I think the other part to that is exactly what we're talking about. This is why, this is how that, that system, right? How it has impacted you as yep. a parent. It has created the anxiety in you. And so mm -hmm. I think that is a sign that you have to do some work also on this. So how how do I exist in this world where my fear, because that's the other thing is we can't live in fear. This is, this is what's so hard is like, we also can't live in fear. So what, what is in my control? What can I do to, um, it, you know, do to try to ensure my safety. And then what is just like, I, I can't live in fear. And so right. I think if you find yourself being a parent who is losing their cool, who is very, very anxious, that is a sign that your mental health is suffering and you need some support around that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Last question um, that Damiana says is the answer to find refuge in living in other places. Mm -hmm. I've heard many experts express they feel safer and more relaxed living abroad. Your thoughts? My thoughts is I've been looking at a country of other countries. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think if, if you find if you find a place that because there are definitely countries where black people and brown people feel much safer and feel like they don't have to necessarily. Um, be concerned about it on such an ongoing regular basis and especially when it feels like there's this complete um, disrespect of your rights and all of that definitely um, but I think that would take you know research obviously because I think about um, the people that I do know that live abroad it just depends on where you go there are certain countries that's definitely great and there are other countries that's like nope we still have racism it just looks different right it's just not as blatant and within all of the systems, but they're still there and they still make it harder for black and brown people to get stuff done. And it still makes it harder, you know, um, for us to have, have certain access and things like that. But I do, I, I believe in finding safe spaces. And so if that means finding a place outside of the U.S. where you can feel safe, then that is, that could be the answer. Yeah, yeah, because I, I yeah, you know, anti-blackness is universal um you know indigenous indigenous folks are, are discriminated everywhere you go um so yep. yes but i get it i get the question i get where the question is coming from um we're therapists but we're human first and i think both yep. of us you know i've had conversations with some of my friends and other you know therapists friends like where are we moving <laughs> So until then, we hope that you take some of these tips that we've shared with you today and at least reflect on some of what we shared when you are considering, um, you know, why you're struggling, that it's not necessarily, I won't say not necessarily, it is not a sign of weakness. There are right. a lot of factors entailed. So we 
have a have an announcement for y'all also because we want to um continue this conversation and we want to give you resources so ebony tell them about the event we got coming up later this month the free event we got coming up this month Yes, we have decided that it is extremely important for us to get in front of our communities more often. Um, and that includes free events like the one that we're having at the end of this month, which is July 28th at 7 p.m. So we will be hosting an event, Healing with Melanin and Mental Health, where we will talk about like, what can you do? What are the steps in order for you to start your mental health journey? What does it look like for you to go on a mental health journey? And what can, can we break it down into like, if you just do these things and start going that way, then you will help improve your mental health. And, and especially because as we've talked about before, therapy is not always accessible to everyone, right? And it's not always easily and readily available, whether that's affordability, whether it's just not knowing where to start or who to go to, all of that. So we want to make sure that we're creating opportunities for everyone to get the healing that they need. And so that will be July 28th, 7 p.m. Um, and so you can sign up via the link in five minutes because I didn't get to lock in before. <laughs> But the link will be in the bio, and uh, we would love to see y'all there. Again, this is a free event. We just really want to be able to talk about these steps and, and what it looks like, um, and we're excited to have you come join us for more of these conversations. Yeah, yeah. And be sure to check out our uh, podcast. We have a podcast between sessions. So if you love these conversations, if you're enjoying these conversations, we got a whole lot more of those conversations. If you check us out on the between sessions, <laughs> uh, we had some, we've recently been having some, we've, oh, we've had amazing guests. Yeah. Here, but these last ones, woo! I'm playing them back too and listening to them. So make sure you check out our Between Sessions podcast. If you're looking for a yes. therapist in your area, be sure you check out our online national directory, melaninandmentalhealth.com. I don't know why that came out like that, like a twang. <laughs> Emphasize um, the melanin. Right, melaninandmentalhealth.com. And you can also find some of our merch there like this. I love therapy. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, keep that conversation, that mental health conversation going. Um, and so, again, if you are just joining, hope you play some of this back and know that we have a free event on July 28th, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, Heal with Mental Health, at Melanin and Mental Health. And we are going to be giving you a framework of how you can manage your mental health. So, until next week, y'all. We'll talk to y'all later. Bye. Bye.